first, uh, I think many of you are, have, do not uh, know much about interventional radiology in general, so I wanted to provide a brief, a brief overview there um, uh, by way of our, uh, our initiative uh, to explain interventional radiology to the general public. We have a, a series of video here. So. I don't remember when I found out that my condition could affect pregnancy. She could develop very life-threatening clots. Well, I didn't think in my wildest dreams this would be this difficult on her. Sometimes I'll just yell at the veins, you know, you're not going to win. <laughs> We're going to get through there. And if we can't get from there to there, we can't do anything to help her. When she comes in, I know that she has gangrenous changes in her toes, which means they're black. Where there's a wound, you don't have enough oxygen, bacteria can just flow up your leg. Then it becomes an emergency amputation. There's no chance to save the limb. It was harder, I think, when it became less hypothetical and more real. Looking at the CAT scan and talking to the intensive care colleague, my sense was that if we didn't proceed with this patient immediately, that she would die. Just over 50 years ago, surgery was the only option for many serious medical problems. Thanks to some innovative doctors and their stealth approach, we now have the tools and technology to treat these problems using a wire inserted through a tiny pinhole in the skin. No surgery, no stitches, no scars. This is an inside job. By injecting dye directly into the body, they can see the unseen. Traveling through the blood vessels like highways, they penetrate the microcosmos of the human anatomy, offering big solutions without big incisions. Expanding the realm of the possible, giving hope where there was none. This is the story of today's real superheroes, the inspired doctors who are saving lives and treating clots, cancers, disease, stroke, all without a scalpel. Thanks. So I'd encourage you all to, uh, you, can, you can find that on Vimeo or on Amazon Video. Uh, so kind of what is interventional oncology? Well, let's, let's first talk about what's killing us. So when we think back to the turn of the century in 1900, it was a lot of infectious diseases. And we can really look at the success there, and particularly in terms of childhood mortality, we don't see these things killing us in the same numbers anymore. Now the two big ones are cancer and heart disease. And to go even further, when you really look at the curves within the United States at least, what you see is that heart disease has actually been coming down. And cancer, some, some uh, believe that this year it actually eclipsed heart disease as the number one killer. And what this map is showing is in blue, the states that used to be heart disease and now are cancer as the number one killer, and in green are still um, the remainder of the state. So about 22 states, cancer is now the number one killer over heart disease. So obviously a huge, a huge market there. When you think about the three pillars of cancer care, the traditional pillar was actually surgery. So one of the first things, if you go back to a thousand years ago, was these medieval, what looked like medieval torture devices were actually used for plunging uh, hot probes into tumors and other ways of surgically trying to excise tumors. So that's surgical oncology. Next came really chemotherapy and medical oncology, and not too long after that came radiation oncology. And, and for the last, really, uh, century, these have been the three pillars of cancer care. So what's interventional oncology? This is the subspecialty field of interventional radiology that I just showed you a short video kind of introducing you to that deals with diagnosis and treatment of these cancer, uh, cancer problems and cancer itself using minimally in invasive uh, procedures. So when you think about, you know, again, using a similar metaphor, um, we, we have our own versions of surgical uh, radiation and chemotherapy. So we use something called ablation. Um, as using either ultrasound or cryo, so a very, a very cold uh, needle or microwave ablation. Those are the three that we most commonly use today. Um, we use em embolization of tumors, but instead of being systemic delivery of chemotherapy, it's localized delivery of chemotherapy just to the tumor itself. And then we use also something called radioembolization, uh, transarterial radioembolization for treating tumors uh, with local radiation through the form of beads. So when you think about percutaneous ablation, um, basically what this, and this is just a couple of my patients here. Here's a patient who has a, this is what's called a PET scan. So they have a nuclear medicine agent injected at the same time they get a CT scan to demonstrate where there was still a cancer recurrence. Unfortunately, this cancer recurrence was right next to the aorta. This patient had already lost one lobe of their lung uh, from, from a cancer. And so the surgeon felt that they were too high of a risk to lose any more lung tissue. And so what I did here was, um, uh, in, the person is awake the entire time. They're in a CT scanner. I drop the lung partially. 
uh, I put a probe in, as you can see, uh, right there very close to the aorta, and I freeze the tumor, and that gets rid of it. So this is something called cryoablation. Um, I do the same thing in adrenal. So here's an adrenal that's filled with lung cancer, and I've put a number of probes into it, and then you can see at the end, it basically turns into this gray, uh, this uh, dark gray, which is basically representation of the cancer being gone. So uh, this is something that I do every day. I do. Um, several of these ablations uh, a day, uh, typically on my clinical service. What's also interesting about ablation is that ablation, because of the fact that you're leaving uh, uh, the uh, tumor material behind, unlike surgical excision, what you're getting is release of tumor antigens. Uh, now, it turns out that uh, that's pretty cool. So occasionally I'll ablate one, one tumor and you'll see tumors in other parts of the body go away. But sometimes you see the opposite effect. You'll ablate one tumor and you actually see tumors in other parts of the body grow faster. And the reason why that is is because activation of the immune system is quite complex and there's a whole other separate branch of the immune system we're starting to understand over the last decade, which is called the regulatory immune system, which consists of T cell, uh, regulatory T cells and uh, myelodrive suppressor cells. And what happens is you activate that part of the immune system too. So what that means is that, uh, that you have the potential to actually being, making, making the cancer worse in other places. So now what we're doing is actually combining ablation with immune modulation drugs like ipilimumab, pembrolizumab, et cetera, in clinical trials to try to harness that positive immune response that you're getting while releasing the breaks of the immune system at the same time. And so this is, uh, this is where a lot of the future, my immediate future in my field is going. So the other technology, kind of our, our, our correlate to medical oncology is something we call transarterial chemoembolization. Um, and so what this is, is you put a catheter up, in this case they're showing a, a representative liver cancer, and in in, this is the actual images that I would be looking at in the, uh, in the operating theater. And you put a catheter up into the vessels leading to the cancer, and you deposit uh, little beads with chemotherapy in them, or you deposit an oily substance um, that's been uh, mixed with the chemotherapy, and that gets stuck in the tumor and causes regression of the tumor. Um, this, this is just a little describes, description of that treating uh, liver procedure. cancer with minimally invasive image guided procedures. Liver cancer is the fifth most common type of cancer in the United States. Sadly, liver cancer is on the rise. Certain populations have a higher risk of developing liver cancer, including people of Asian, Hispanic, and African descent, as well as veterans and baby boomers. Interventional radiologists are physicians who specialize in minimally invasive image-guided procedures, including ones used to treat liver cancer. About 80 or 90 percent of my practice involves the treatment of cancers that cannot be removed surgically. Uh, however, we don't send these patients home to die. There are plenty of options, uh, very effective options, that can not only reduce the symptoms involved with cancer, but also can extend people's lifespan. One treatment blocks the blood vessels to the tumor using tiny beads soaked in chemotherapy. This starves the tumor of blood while poisoning it directly without causing side effects to the rest of the body like hair loss and vomiting. This treatment is called transarterial chemoembolization, or TACE, T-A-C-E. Mr. Wei is a U.S. veteran and a recipient of the Purple Heart Medal. When he was diagnosed with liver cancer several years ago, he had never heard of TACE. So y'all have saved my life. I, I was given a death sentence of nine months to live. I've had three MRIs since then, and all of them have been clean. The tumors haven't come back, and there are no new tumors. To learn more about TACE and other minimally invasive image-guided procedures for the treatment of cancer, visit www.theii.org. So uh, the, last, the last one that um, I wanted to talk about was radioembolization. So it's a, the, the procedure is essentially the same. Instead of, instead of putting in chemotherapy beads, you put in little radioactive particles, and they have both a plastic particle, which is made by a company Surtex, or a glass particle, which is made by a company Therosphere, which is now owned by BTG. And both of these have the same effect where you can treat liver cancer or metastatic cancer to the uh, liver. Now, the reason why the liver is somewhat special is because there's actually a dual blood supply. So the majority of the liver's blood comes from the gut. So everything you put in your mouth, 
uh, uh, after you're born, uh, goes through uh, the portal vein into the liver, and that's where the liver derives most of its blood supply. Whereas the hepatic artery is useful for liver development in utero, that's where tumors recruit their blood supply. So you're able to actually close off the blood vessels that go to the tumor from the hepatic artery while preserving liver function. So I just wanted to, I, I can give you all of the clinical trials that have been done demonstrating efficacy. Obviously, it's, it's been out now for, for more than 30 years, these treatments. But I think that, uh, that an anecdotal uh, often stick in the brain better. And I just want to talk about this patient who had, um, she had a very large, actually, mass in her pancreatic tail. So this is what's called an angiogram. I put a catheter up from her leg and into her, into her artery. And I shot dye in, and I could see the large mass. And I could also go and see multiple masses in both sides of her liver. This patient presented to me, uh, they had told her, you know, she was actually in a coma in the hospital, in my hospital. Her son knew me because he was a, a representative for Janssen Pharmaceuticals, and he said, you know, can you do something for her? They've, they've told us that, unfortunately, she's going to die. Um, so I, you know, I was like, well, she's got pretty advanced cancer, but, and she is in a coma, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. So I, I treated one side. Uh, she didn't have a response. I treated the other side. And then basically what happened was they decided to withdraw care because she didn't have, within a few days, response. So they withdrew care, and then she woke up a few days later. <laughs> and, uh, and then she had a gradual improvement in mentation. She was discharged to rehab facility, and I just talked to her actually when I was backstage, and she's doing very well. Um, I've gone back now and subsequently actually uh, embolized her, her, her tumor. And what you can see is that her liver has regenerated significantly. And since this time, the, the time of this MRI scan, I've also embolized the primary tumor. So that's just kind of an example of the, the technology as it exists today. Um, but I wanted to talk a little bit about what's coming out of our lab. I have a big research lab at University of Pennsylvania. And so we're doing what we like to call a functionalized version of precision medicine. So I take biopsies. And so when you talk about what, 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 how are we going to end up with personalized medicine, we have to get the tissue. And so interventional radiologists are critical in this, and we serve central place in this whole role because we're, we're, we're the ones who get, the, get that tissue with biopsies. So we take those, those tissue samples, we grow them up in the lab, we expand them, and then we have a CRISPR library we've created uh, for known drug targets. So we're only looking at proteins where we know that the pharmaceutical companies have already made a druggable target. And what happens is once we identify that, we do in-target validation of the drug to show that indeed their cancer is susceptible. So this allows us to have a high throughput screening method. And then of course that arrives back with, we already know from that calculation what the drug is that the patient should be on. Uh, the other technology I wanted to mention uh, because it's dear to my heart is one that we've developed in our lab is called antivascular ultrasound. So what this is is we use ultrasound contrast agents as a transducer of the energy from ultrasound. That causes damage to the vasculature and, 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 uh, and inflammation within tumors. And I've been uh, doing a lot of studies demonstrating the immune response to this therapy, um, as well as using this in the setting of, uh, of checkpoint inhibitors and other immunotherapies. Another technology that I think you know, was already mentioned by one of the earlier speakers and I think is on the cutting edge, in fact, I'm, I'm headed to the FDA at the end of this week to have a whole conference on this, is focused ultrasound. So this is something that's already, we have three clinical trials in the United States using this. It goes right through the, the skull. You just shave the patient's head. That's what they end up with. No, no cuts, no uh, you know, scars to heal. Um, and we focus ultrasound down on the brain tumor um, and cause deposition of chemotherapy as well as uh, primary treatment of brain tumors. But this, this technique is used for all kinds of um, uh, uh, uses within the brain as well as solid tumors in other organs. So uh, in brief, I, I, I think that the future of oncology is patient-centered, precise, and personalized. It's going to be minimally invasive. It's going to have image guidance. And there's going to be convergence of technologies that have talked about immunotherapy and, and ablation technologies. And I think that we, at this point, can, can safely say that interventional oncology is now one of the, the fourth pillar of, of uh, cancer care. And just thank you so much. So this is amazing. We're a lot of things coming together. Um, how many sort of stick in the muds do you find in your academic institution or others that aren't sort of thinking this way? And, and how can we help stir the pot? Well, I think that um, what, I, what I find the hardest actually is when you're looking at something where there's dual technologies. So when I'm using a blade technologies, those folks are very on board with knowing what is the immune response to their, for example, the cryoablation company or the microwave ablation company. But I brought Merck in, and we were setting up a whole clinical trial looking at combining their drugs with the device companies. But it, re it very quickly develops into a squabbling about who owns which side of the, the technology, and how do you run this clinical trial, and they want their people to do it, and we want our people to do it. So I think that those are, those are some of the issues we're still working out. In terms of what's happening in our lab at a place like Penn, people are very enthusiastic for new technologies and for 
um, advancing the, the field there. So I think that the sclerosis really is in how do you, how do you bridge what is traditionally siloed information and, and build this convergence, because that's where things can actually get exponential. Great. Thanks, Stephen, and join us workshop tomorrow if you want to learn more. Yeah, Thanks. Thank you.